Uh, tonight, we've got a real treat for everyone, a chance to hear from and interact with Washington Post reporter Eugene Scott. Uh, this event is actually, I think, the last of a monthly series of talks this academic year um, sponsored by our journalism program uh, under the title Pressing Matters, Media in the Fake News Era, a program that's been generously supported by a donor to Asbury's School of Communication Arts. These webinars are normally hosted by Rich Manieri, our uh, uh, primary journalism professor, but tonight he's otherwise occupied. Uh, so I'm gonna be subbing for him. Um, it turns out that my involvement, I think, is, is fortuitous. Um, we had already decided to co-sponsor this event um, with the Pitt Center. And uh, given that our speaker tonight uh, spent so much of his time covering issues of politics and policy, uh, I think this was a good, a good fit uh, for our collaboration tonight. So let me turn to uh, Eugene here, our guest for tonight. Uh, Eugene's had a fascinating career. Uh, that's brought him to the post, um, and uh, I hope he'll get to, to talk about his, his background some more with everyone. Uh, he's got a bachelor's degree uh, from the University of North Carolina, an MPA degree from Harvard University. Uh, Eugene, was that from the Kennedy School? Yes, yes, from the Kennedy School. Okay, uh, and he's also served as a fellow at Georgetown University's Institute of Politics. Uh, before coming to the Post, uh, he was, among other things, a reporter for CNN Politics. He's covered um, a wide range of, of media, not just, uh, not, not just written journalism. Uh, he's also hosted podcasts, and he's appeared on NPR, MSNBC, Time, Newsweek, and a variety of other news outlets. Um, I'm going to turn this over to Eugene. We've asked him to speak for about a half an hour, but he may not go that long, and uh, then we'll be able to get right into some Q&A. Uh, and if you have a question uh, that materializes along the way, um, just put it in the chat and Catherine's gonna, gonna manage all of that. And I'm gonna kind of step out of the front of the screen and uh, move this so that uh, you all can see some of the students are here uh, in the Kinlaw boardroom, uh, just sharing some donuts and so soda and enjoying being with one another. So uh, Eugene, I'm tossing the ball to you. Awesome, thank you so much, Steve, for having me. And I am so glad to be here with all of you this evening. Um, as I shared with Steve and Catherine earlier, uh, when I speak at universities, I certainly uh, open things up with uh, a talk addressing the topics that uh, were previously discussed. But what I really like to do is open up or have my visits be mostly Q and A, uh, because in my experience, I have learned that students are probably at this point in the semester uh, out lectured, um, but what they don't get to experience pretty often, and I say this with humility, is the opportunity to just ask very direct questions to someone in the mainstream media. Um, and there literally is no question that you could ask me that uh, I think would be too uh, difficult or too offensive or that I won't want to uh, answer. And so the bulk of our time together will be focused on Q and A's and I really look forward to uh, just hearing some of your ideas and concerns. But I first wanted to just start uh, with commending you all uh, for uh, finding a way to get to the end of the semester during a very difficult time. I cannot imagine how difficult it is to attempt to complete your education uh, during a pandemic online, given so many of the physical health and mental health challenges that come with that. And I am incredibly encouraged and inspired by your dedication to your career um, and that you would choose to even spend some time this evening with me uh, as we talk about uh, the role of the media in politics and how it continues to shape our culture. So when I was first invited to speak with you all, um, I was given two important topics to address, uh, polarization and media bias. And while different, they obviously perhaps are somewhat connected. And because they're both important, I'm gonna try my best to speak to them both, uh, but look forward to answering more questions about them later uh, based on what I've previously shared. Then I'll get to the third topic, which was what role can uh, Christians perhaps play in the media or how can they go about pursuing careers in mainstream journalism? So as was previously shared, uh, my name's Eugene Scott. 
And I cover identity politics for the Washington Post. Um, and I started covering identity politics for the Post about three and a half years ago. Um, and one week after uh, President Donald Trump was speaking at a rally in Huntsville, Alabama, uh, where he was trying to uh, increase support for a Senate candidate, where he told NFL owners to throw off NFL players to fire them, should I say, uh, who protest police violence against black people and racism by taking a knee during the national anthem. Um, and in fact, he pretty much said, if you remember, he said, get those sons of these off the field. And the reason why that is so relative or relevant, should I say, is because that speech, that issue, the protest against racism, uh, the, the president and the rights frustration uh, with how they felt these individuals were responding to this issue during the flag, uh, during a moment of patriotism, the, the Pledge of Allegiance, the singing of the national anthem, gets to the heart of identity politics and why I chose to write about them, why I, cho why, why I chose to write about it, why I chose to teach about it, and why I think it's so important that we understand what it is and how it's shaping our culture moving forward. Now, specifically, I'm an analysis writer. The Fix is the section in the post that I write for that focuses on political analysis. Now, political analysis is not direct news reporting and it's not opinion writing. Uh, and that's what makes it difficult. And that's what also makes people mostly frustrated with me. When you write direct news, you would say Eugene spoke at Asbury. Opinion writing would say, uh, Eugene spoke at Asbury and it was bad. Uh, but analysis would say Eugene spoke at Asbury and this is what that means and here are the implications for that. And the reason I chose to write uh, identity politics in, in an analysis uh, uh, vertical is because in my personal life, I've had the benefit, I've had the privilege to move in some very diverse circles in different parts of this country, quite frankly, most people don't have access to. And what I learned in my times living in Scottsdale, Arizona and Harlem and spending time working in the small town south and large cities in the Midwest is that we as a country do not do life deeply with people who are very different from us. We talk about them a lot. We don't talk to them. And our ideas about who they are and what matters to them and what they value are deeply off. And so what we need to do is find people who can go into these spaces, elevate voices in those spaces and help us understand these groups that we are neighbors with and that uh, help influence uh, and shape the world in which we live. We also have decades of data and anecdote and research that show that identity politics is a real thing. Uh, the reality is to many people on the right, it's this boogeyman word that they think only people on the left uh, participate in, but we know that's not true. If you look at polling, we know that on certain issues, people in rural America vote very differently from those in urban America. On other issues, men see things differently than women. On other issues, you have evangelical Christians viewing things differently than members of the black church and the Catholic church. Uh, baby boomers versus millennials, LGBT people versus straight people, and so on and so on. And this isn't bad. It just is. The reality is your various identities do shape how you experience the world and how you move through it. And more importantly, perhaps in the context of Capitol Hill, it also affects the way that policy impacts you. If you are a mother or you are a person without children, or you are a college student, or you're someone uh, who never pursued higher education, or you are an incredibly successful business owner, or you are an employee versus you being a, an employee, um, these things will change how a policy uh, directly impacts you. And the reason why this matters is because as this country becomes increasingly diverse, we are going to be coming in contact with new groups and new issues that require us to think about policy in ways that we previously never have before. And it's gonna be the responsibility of the media to cover that well. And that's gonna be a challenge because the media is nowhere near as diverse as the country that it covers. 
And as a result, the media often gets things wrong that they perhaps would not if newsrooms better reflected the communities that they're a part of. And there are lots of reasons why newsrooms don't look like the worlds in which they cover. Some of it's institutional, some of it's just about the speed of change. But the reality is in the past year or so, there's been a reckoning uh, within conversations in newsrooms that we haven't seen before about what needs to be done to rectify that problem. These differences, these different communities and groups that we're a part of uh, have led to polarization. They've led to differences that make it very difficult to find common ground on. And you see this very often when you look at some of the conversations happening in the Capitol. We live very far apart in ways that were not as much the case maybe in decades past. Um, and the way we think and view those who are different from us has become far more heated um, and, make it, and therefore makes it much more difficult uh, to find common ground and to form policies uh, that benefit everyone. And one of the reasons that, that is the case is because of a partisan media, a highly partisan media um, that is shaped by media bias, perhaps uh, more than what we have seen before. Um, I write for the Washington Post. I do not believe that the Washington Post is this highly biased news publication. Uh, despite what you may hear on Fox News or you may read on The Intercept, uh, publications or news outlets, should I say, to the right or to the left of where Washington Post tries to pr present itself. Uh, it's an organization that aims to report news fairly and accurately um, in a way that re reflects the truth of a story and includes facts and uh, aspects that people in partisan media might consider to be inconvenient. But I think that's important that you communicate that um, so that people can better understand the issues in which are shaping our culture. Media bias is not going anywhere, unfortunately, and it has made navigating the issues that shape our time uh, quite difficult. You may or may not have seen recent surveys from Pew Research Center showing that at least half of Republicans believe that the insurrection on the US Capitol wasn't that big of a deal or wasn't dangerous at all. And the fact of the matter is at least five people were killed. Uh, two members of the US Capitol Police Force committed suicide later and dozens others were injured. But that perspective of what actually happened is shaped by the media you consume. And we know that there are quite a few conservative media outlets uh, that have tried to downplay the severity of what happened. And so when you only consume news that uh, affirms, should I say, uh, your previously held biases and does, don't challenge them, uh, you find yourself walking away with the comfort of being in an uh, echo chamber, but not with the knowledge that one would gain from actually engaging news that's rooted in facts and truth uh, that's me meant and designed to help you better understand an issue. In terms of how Christians can respond uh, to this moment and enter into journalism and, and be good journalists is that uh, you just, at the core is you have to do good work. You have to do good, honest work uh, that is uh, accurate, uh, that has context, uh, that does not uh, lead with whatever your own agenda is, assuming that the job you're trying to get is as a reporter and publication that is not um, you know, set on putting forward a particular agenda. Uh, but ultimately the best way to be um, a good journalist and a good uh, Christian journalist is just to do your job very well. Um, there are countless Christians in mainstream media, regardless of, uh, what might be portrayed in among communities that don't have, among faith communities that don't have the most positive view of mainstream media. Uh, but the way they continue to succeed in this space is by being honest, by being good coworkers, uh, by being competent and having open minds that allow them to entertain ideas and thoughts that perhaps they would not if they were stuck in their bubbles. And so, I have found uh, that when you don't put your identities to your side, but that you leave room for the possibility that your view and your worldview is not the sole worldview, um, you realize then in that, that moment that the world is bigger than your world. And that's how you end up being an effective journalist.
I would love to talk to you more about polarization, about media bias, about politics and faith and identity politics and so many other issues. But that's my entry level right there, my entry piece, should I say, in terms of what it is that I do, how I think it's shaping where we are and where things can go from here. Uh, Catherine, you want to go ahead and uh, issue a couple of those questions and then um, others can, can come and join in. Sure, yeah. So I was going to um, say that we collected a couple of uh, questions from journalism students um, in Prof. Maneri's classes. Um, and if I can just pitch some of those to you to hear sure. take, um, from them. Um, so just a really basic level question. What advice do you have for young journalists, which I know you just kind of addressed sure. in good work. So do you have any more specifics for journalists yeah. just entering the field? Absolutely. I would say that you need to read widely. Um, you, the best way you become better at a craft is by studying people who are good at it. And so assuming you want to host a podcast or be an on-air political analyst or write columns, uh, it would be wise to study those who have been doing what it is that you're interested in doing for a while learn what makes them great, but also try to find your own voice, but also know what it is that you bring to the table that makes you unique and valuable. This is a very difficult industry to get into, but not impossible. And one of the ways you find your way in is by somehow distinguishing yourself uh, from those who are you're competing with. And, and it's not always easy to figure out what it is that makes you special. But fortunately, if you have uh, mentors or professors or former editors who can say you're really good at this thing, this is your strong point, uh, you'll have a better idea of what it is that makes you, that can make you a more valuable, um, uh, you know, addition to a media organization. I'd also say join student media. If you're not writing for a student newspaper or on a student television show, um, you should join that. Um, you should start a blog and you should intern. This is probably not what your professors want me to say, but the reality is uh, student media and internship experience mean far more in launching a journalism career than your grades. Um, I have never at, had a recruitment editor ask for my GPA, but they did want to know if I wrote for the newspaper. They did want to know if I was on the uh, student radio uh, program. And, and so you have to get involved. But school obviously is valuable, especially if you're uh, pursuing a liberal arts education because this, the critical thinking that is uh, used to help you in these classes is necessary uh, to be a successful journalist. So um, do take your studies very seriously, but do not be so consumed by them um, that you neglect the real world experience that student media internships provide. I'm going to turn, stop to turn my air on for one second because I'm wearing a necktie and burning up. Um, so just, just one second. And to everyone else um, uh, on online on the Zoom call, if you have any questions you want me to to um, pitch to Eugene, feel free to enter those in the chat, and I'll get to them as available. So, all right, so another question a student asked, um, has being a black man in the media made your experience significantly different than other like mainstream experiences in the media and how? And that's a great question. And it's one of the reasons why I love Q and A. And so this, this, is, this will be a, a bit longer. Um, I grew up in Washington, D.C., um, and uh, if you know much about D.C., it is a place uh, where there has, for at least 50 years, been a very large uh, Black middle and upper class community. Um, and that's in part because there are quite a few historically Black colleges in and around D.C., and we know that historically Black colleges are has, have historically uh, been a direct link to the Black middle and upper class. But I, I did not see that reflected in the media as a kid. Most of the Black people I saw watching the news uh, were either suspected criminals, 
um, or athletes. And that is part of the Black experience, just like that's part of the white American experience. But it's not the totality of the Black experience. And I can remember being a kid thinking, I want to be a journalist to tell the diversity of the Black story. And so I actually began my journalism career in high school working for BET News when it was headquartered here in DC on a show that talked about issues related to Black youth. And so while I haven't always focused on identity politics, there has been a commitment to writing about race and diversity throughout my 20 year career, uh, because that is what I always felt needed uh, more coverage um, in the media. Uh, despite perhaps what you may see um, on TV in terms of you know, an analyst here or a host there, uh, elite media, uh, I mean, these major publications uh, and networks and based usually in DC, New York, and maybe LA are overwhelmingly white. Um, and so that affects the coverage and how much attention some issues get. Uh, the past year or so though, uh, when there has been a reckoning on issues related to racism in ways that we uh, previously had not seen, uh, has been very uh, challenging and um, you know, emotionally taxing, but also rewarding as a black man. Um, I am one of the main analysts for the Washington Post show uh, covering the Derek Chauvin trial of the Minneapolis police officer who uh, killed uh, George Floyd. And I last Monday was the first day of the trial and I had to watch the trial on, you know, on set. And that was the first day I actually saw the entire video of Chauvin kneeling on Floyd's neck. Um, because the reality is, as a Black man, and I've spoke, spoken about this on another uh, panel um, that, was all of, that was full of Black men who cover issues related uh, to racism, is that it can be very traumatic uh, watching uh, people view your life and your, your existence uh, so, so insignificantly. Um, and it can be difficult not letting all of your uh, biases shape your coverage. Uh, and uh, that has not been um, something that I have realized early on, but in more, perhaps more recent years have come to fully realize um, how valuable and important it is to process these things with a community, uh, with your editors who understand how challenging all of this can be because my sole identity is not as a journalist. Uh, but also with a mental health professional. Uh, I spent most of the past year um, uh, visiting a therapist every two weeks, just processing not just you know my professional life, my personal life as well, but um, writing, talking through and trying to be in the best and healthiest position to provide the best coverage to readers as possible um, in a way that honors the story, but also protects myself. And so that's a very long answer to say that my identity as a black man shapes a lot of the things that I do professionally, especially when I write about identity, but especially over the past four years. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. And that kind of segues into another question that um, a student asked, um, how do you avoid personal biases in your own reporting and how does your faith impact your reporting then? So, um, the what what I tell people is I never write anything that um, gets directly to you. Um, so it's not like I write something and then it's published. I have multiple editors who look at my work before it go, gets to you. And none of my editors um, hold my identities. Um, my immediate editor, I'm, I'm a, a black guy uh, from Washington DC who is single with no kids. My immediate editor, it's a white woman from rural Louisiana. Uh, she's a mother of two. And like, we can go on and on and on about our differences. And so um, I'm self-aware enough to generally know when my own bias is tainting an idea, uh, but it does happen um, because I'm human and sometimes things get written that uh, I may get some pushback on, but quite frankly, it doesn't, um, that doesn't happen often. And part of that, comes from uh, me spending more than a decade as a, a straight news reporter, um, opposed to you know getting to the point where I write analysis and just really fine tuning the art of just telling a story for what it is. 
but uh, beyond experience, it's about having other people in a newsroom who can, um, you know, push back and, and question and, and make you second uh, guess some things. In terms of faith, and I think it's very important, I, when I think of faith and write about faith, I think about faith and values and beliefs. The reality is everyone has a worldview, everyone has faith, everyone has values, everyone has a belief, uh, belief system. Uh, the reality is I'm not incredibly public about my beliefs and my opinions because as someone who writes about religion, um, it is important that I not present uh, as if I am taking or aligned with a particular worldview or not uh, that I am writing about. Um, but in terms of my values, uh, my personal values, my personal faith and belief, it's about like, it's, it's, it's rooted in my strong conviction and belief that we must love our neighbor as ourselves. And that is why I write about groups that I'm not a part of, that personally I may disagree with in ways that I think respect them and are charitable and try my best to accurately uh, articulate their, their view in a way that they would recognize. But quite frankly, that doesn't mean I'll shy away from communicating something that they may think um, doesn't put them in the best light if it's actually true. Um, it is, I am not, uh, a journalist whose faith is the main adjective uh, that um, describes his work. I'm a journalist first, first and whatever other identities I bring uh, to my work um, add to that and contribute to that, but they don't define that at all. Have there ever been times when um, the lines between your job and your personal life or personal values have become blurred? Like, have people ever been so upset with your political coverage that it bleeds into your personal life? You know, I've been writing a lot about racism in the past four years um, under the Trump administration. And um, there, there are readers who don't like how I write about race. Um, they don't like that I, um, you know, say that systemic racism is uh, a thing, that unconscious bias is a thing, that identity politics exists, that concepts like white privilege are uh, real. Um, people get frustrated about that, about that and uh, have, uh, you know, decided they wanted to write back or push back or uh, disengage. And, and that is, you know, they're right. Um, I'm, I'm not here to like make readers uh, feel like I agree completely with them um, because I can't, my, my experiences are so very and so fundamentally different from so many of the people who disagree with me uh, that um, reasonably, uh, I, I should not be expected to uh, view things exactly the same way that they do. Um, and I um, am okay with that in ways that perhaps I was not uh, when I was younger, um, because I, I know what I am and who I am and what my job is. Uh, but it can be very difficult at times when we live in a world where people think your job is to report what they want. Um, and part of that is understandable because there are media outlets and personalities whose that is their job and that's not mine. And so I have found more generally, most people's frustration with the mainstream media and journalists in particular is directly tied to what they think that person's job is. And I have found that if you don't know what this person is supposed to be doing, um, you can often get upset with them. And just briefly, I'll mention a good um, friend of mine and colleague at the Washington Post, Jonathan Capehart, uh, is a columnist. And he, most of the hate mail he gets is from people saying, well, that's just your opinion. Well, he's a columnist. He's paid to write his opinion. And much of the frustration is that they don't understand that. And perhaps they think he's a reporter. And I'm not sure why, because he doesn't present as one. But um, he often finds himself in situations where um, his work uh, and his personal life 
um, conflict and there can be difficult moments for himself and for readers. And I've learned to um, navigate those situations in my own life uh, from watching him quite a bit. Another student asks um, if political affiliation matters when being selected for a job at major newspapers. You know, it depends on the job. And if you are a Republican or a Democrat, I think it's, um, I think it would be in the best interest of you and your editors, you and your, you and like your immediate editors uh, to know that. Um, most journalists I know at mainstream organizations are independent. And, and that is actually, you know, where America is trending, like most people are actually independent. Um, but uh, I don't know of any situation uh, where anyone um, was discriminated against or not hired because of their political affiliation. Um, but uh, if you are an active member of a political party, that will probably directly um, limit how much you can uh, write about certain issues. And another student asks, um, what's the hardest ethical dilemma that you faced as a journalist? That's interesting. And it's kind of tied to what uh, the previous question, um, because I write about a lot of uh, political issues and policy topics, I uh, am not like involved with uh, a lot of groups or issues personally or financially. Uh, that I actually care a lot about. And that's hard because I um, have been watching a lot of groups and organizations uh, over the past few years uh, aggressively um, seek to change the world in ways that they believe uh, are most beneficial. Um, and I have to sit on the sidelines. Um, and, uh, you know, that quite frankly, it just kind of sucks sometimes because as much as I'm a journalist, I'm like other things as well. Um, I mean, an easy example is that um, you can probably imagine that I um, think police violence against black people is a real issue, um, but like I don't give to Black Lives Matter or any organization like that, or nor am I a member of any of them, um, but I, uh, do want police violence against black people to, to end um, or end uh, that is uh, something that I cannot say or get in, involved in more than what I've just shared. I mean, even my sharing what I just shared, there are journalists who would probably be like, that's too far because that would communicate um, uh, a degree of bias that could make it difficult for you to do your job. But I personally am at a point in my career where I'm, I am uh, okay and comfortable with saying police violence against black people is not a good thing. Um, and, uh, you know, we'll, we'll deal with what comes from that. And so that's one of the um, ethical challenges and concerns that, um, you know, I, I, I face and that can make, um, you know, doing my job difficult in some ways. Yeah, do you ever feel like you have to stifle your own personal convictions then to present yourself as completely unbiased or at least present your argument as unbiased as possible? Um, not really in my writing because that's just not what I'm hired to do, right? So like, I think about how the first few years of my life, I was an education reporter um, I have thoughts on education, um, but I wasn't hired to share my thoughts on education. And so it doesn't feel stifling. And I think um, it's really interesting. You know, I'm, I'm, I am what is considered an elderly millennial. Um, and so I did not grow up. I, I finished undergrad before Facebook even existed for perspective. And so I did not grow up in a climate where um, I was just used to putting out my thoughts left and right. Um, and I don't say that to, you know, sound patronizing or condescending at all to younger people. But I do think from my experiences, teaching and mentoring that individuals who grew up 
um, being able to share their ideas um, freely and consistently whenever they want may find it more stifling to be in a profession where they can't do that anymore um, than those of us who weren't used to doing that at all in the first place, if that makes any sense. Um, but I will say I am a little more, um, I, I, I feel a bit more free on social media to put out things, but I, there's still a line um, that, I, that I won't cross because of what I do. And I have found that to be uh, more beneficial for me than harmful. I, I think we could stand to entertain the idea that not everybody needs to hear our thoughts all the time. And it's okay um, as a journalist and as a student and as a person to just keep some things to yourself. Getting back to identity politics specifically, another student asked if there are, um, um, where specifically do you see identity politics making a negative impact on quality news gathering and reporting? Um, I think when a news program or publication um, in an effort to write about or report on issues um, that are of concern to, you know, a group that they rely on to stay on the air or in circulation, um, when they caricature groups that they aren't a part of in ways that just aren't honest or aren't true, um, that's very dangerous and unhelpful. Um, I think broad general generalizations um, about evangelicals or about white people or about liberals or about gay people are ultimately harmful because they're not true. Um, and they uh, reduce people to uh, their worst moments and caricatures. Um, and ultimately that's not helpful. Um, and I have, it's, it's, it's fascinating when you see people come in contact with people that are different from them uh, and they have to put all of the, um, you know, dogma and indoctrination into practice in real life. And uh, it becomes difficult to uh, perhaps uh, reconcile the two things. I'll never forget, I was, um, at church the Sunday before election day 2016. And one of the ministers in a Sunday school class said something along the lines of, um, you know what, regardless of what happens, God is sovereign and in control, you know, blessed be the name of the Lord or something like that. And the church is a very popular one in DC in the sense that like when a lot of uh, people from conservative Christian worlds visit the city, they visit that church. And there's a woman in the class who was shocked that the minister said, you know, that whatever happens is going to be okay. And she literally goes, um, we can't let the demon crats win. Um, and uh, I, I, I laughed out of like shock and awkwardness and discomfort because that actually is not like the position of that church. It's a church that's on Capitol Hill and there are lots of Democrats and Republicans who attend that church. But it, I, was, I had never heard that term before and it made me wonder um, where does she do life where she is taught where the people talking about people left of the owl are uh, equated to demons. Um, and to me, that is an example of just how um, identity politics at its worst. And I'm, I'm sure she's a part of a community that believes that they're protecting evangelicals and doing the will of God and doing what's right, but they're doing it in a way that I think, for lack of a better phrase, demonizes people outside of uh, their tribe. Um, in ways that aren't helpful. Along a similar vein, um, 
We had a question from Glenn. He was asking um, if, if you could say something about what white identity looks like in our uh, common political life, because you mentioned earlier that many white people see identity politics as something that belongs to other people. Right. Yeah, I mean, I think um, there are lots of conversations about like what what is whiteness? Um, and that is uh, not an easy question to answer. I think there is greater diversity within white among white people than I think a lot of people even are aware of, including white people. Um, I think one of the interesting moments about 2016 um, is that the mainstream media paid more attention to white working class Americans than it previously ever had. Um, and that's in part because there, there are not a lot of people at the New York Times and CNN and uh, even Fox News, quite frankly, that are white working class or even come from white working class communities. Um, but the idea that um, I, I, I don't, I don't know how I would define whiteness, but I, I know how I would define uh, uh, being not white. Um, and for the sake of white identity politics, which is the idea that uh, sociologists and people who study the topic believe that President Trump um, uh, was unapologetically stoking, it's this idea of uh, that's rooted in the, these traditional um, values uh, of a time in America where, where things were less diverse, where people in power were uh, overwhelmingly white and the values and interests and politics of uh, those who were most influential more aligned with white people. Um, I think we are seeing some shifts in terms of how white people view multiple issues. There was a, um, a poll that came out, I think it was Pew Research Center about how even white Republicans under 30 um, are having conversations about racism and systemic injustice at levels that older white people aren't or weren't historically. Um, and so, I think there are questions that um, have not yet been answered, but are still being considered right now in terms of what does it mean to be a white person in this particular moment where conversations about systemic injustice and housing and education and uh, law enforcement are being had um, that have yet to be completely answered. How have you seen cancel culture and identity politics collide? So I'm not really sure that cancel culture is a thing. Um, and I, I say that because I'm not sure anyone, like who, who's been canceled? Like, I don't, I don't, I, I and I, and, and this, and, and I would love to like, you know, go to like have, hear more from the person who asked the question. I think there are times when we say and do things and there are consequences for them. Um, and uh, you are not allowed to say whatever you want, wherever you want, um, because uh, there are standards that spaces have uh, that prevent uh, certain ideas and words from moving forward. But I mean, like, Bill O'Reilly still has a podcast. Like Megan Kelly was on the news and BBC weighing in on Prince Harry and Meghan Markle for some reason. Um, and as we see, President Trump releases statements every week now that get covered in the mainstream media. Um, uh, and he's still on Instagram and Facebook. And so I think sometimes when people uh, express their frustration about cancel culture, what they are upset about is the lack of permission to say whatever you want, wherever you want, without any consequences. And I don't think that's a bad thing. Um, but I do think um, most people who have faced um, repercussions for saying things that were unpopular, find other places to say it and are, and are still largely well received. 
in terms of having day things, um, Glenn asked, um, what media outlets on the left and right do you recommend as responsibly engaging in truth seeking? So how can yeah. we know if our favorite media is being responsible? So I think The Bulwark uh, is a great uh, conservative online publication. Um, I respect the American conservative. Um, I think, uh, trying to think, I follow a lot of like individuals and not necessarily publications. And so I think about, um, you know, people I, I see talking on Twitter. I think mainstream media organizations that have conservative voices, um, Henry Olson uh, writes for the Washington Post, Hugh Hewitt, it's a conservative who writes for the Post. Um, I think these are good um, people and publications to follow to understand uh, conservative viewpoints and that are based on fact and that, uh, learn, that largely portray people outside of their tribe in ways that are respectful. Um, liberal left-leaning um, publications that I respect and appreciate and think do good work are um, like The Atlantic, I think is amazing. Um, I think Crooked Media podcasts are pretty strong and Vox, B-O-X, um, is also a place that is that accurately um, covers stories in ways that um, have a left lean, but like aren't false. Um, yeah, I should, I'm asked that question too often for me to have such a poor answer. Uh, but uh, yeah, I should give that some more thought. In terms of the analysis stories that you cover, um, it's not quite like breaking news where it happens and you just spit it out. So how do you determine what you're going to write your analysis on? Do you cover just about everything? No, it's a great story. So every morning um, at 8.45, I have a meeting with my team and I propose three ideas that I'm gonna write about. Uh, that meeting used to be at like 7 a.m. And so it's, you know, one of the joys of the pandemic is that it got moved back a, late, a little bit later. Um, and I tell, I say, this is what I think, you know, based on what has happened, this is an identity news piece, an identity politics angle. And we have a conversation and um, we decide which one story is the best to tackle. And that's what I go about doing. Um, and so I do further reporting and interviewing, speaking with experts, looking at data and try to form a clear uh, point of view or take on the issue. Um, and that's what I write. And that's what she edits and that's what gets published. So what should consumers do to be um, combating against fake news and media bias if we don't necessarily know that it's fake until it's published? Yeah. Yeah. You know, I think one of the ways in which you can determine if news is actually, um, I mean, fake news is a hard thing to even talk about because it's a phrase that Donald Trump came up with to describe news that he didn't think was favorable and disagreed with. Um, and one of the ongoing, um, for lack of a better word, jokes, uh, and I say for lack of a better word because this is pretty serious, um, literally almost everything that Trump called fake news uh, ended up being true. It was confirmed and reporting repeatedly to be true. Um, but what I will speak to, which I think is some, it's, would be a more accurate definition of fake news is disinformation, um, which is something that was a real issue uh, during the 2020 uh, campaign in 2016 as well. And what I would say is one of the ways you check to see uh, if disinformation is something that is uh, happening is if you don't see uh, this issue being covered or acknowledged in other outlets um, and even other outlets of the same bent, um, you should question how true it is. Like, consider your source is a phrase that's very important and should be um, treated as a good barometer for whether or not something can be trusted. And if all you see 
it's this story and on this one site that is not a site that um, many people have even heard of, or if it is a site that it's very popular, but it's known for having a bent that um, causes it to um, portray stories in ways that aren't always uh, fair and charitable, uh, you, you should respond with some degree of uh, skepticism. As a lot of news has become um, filtered out through social media, um, do you see the future of news being just fast and reactive, quick over the diligent, like slower reporting? Yeah, I mean, I think the appetite for breaking news um, isn't going anywhere, um, but I do think with us being on the other side of an election, the, there is less breaking news um, and less interest in news in general. Uh, viewership of like cable news has dropped significantly following the Capitol riots as has readership of online websites, um, understandably. Um, and so I'm hoping that this will allow for more in-depth opportunities uh, for reporting uh, that uh, can help us better understand so many of the institutions and issues that deserve our attention that have largely been ignored um, as we have put so many resources behind, um, you know, covering a breaking news election. So Dr. Clements, do any students there in person with you have questions they would like to talk about? Um, I've got a couple that I'm, I'm just curious about. Um, so what kinds of, of uh, specific issues that you have written about um, have made your editors the most nervous and angst ridden? Hmm. No, that's a great question. Um, I have ideas, but it's not clear to me. Um, I think there are, uh, you'd be surprised how little um, journalists in mainstream newsrooms discuss their own politics. And so uh, I think there are times when assumptions are made about a writer's own politics from by, by maybe like an editor um, who quite frankly just does not know uh, that person's politics. And so I, um, I know there've been times where I have written about evangelicals where a particular editor um, who uh, I assume is also an evangelical um, uh, or should I, I'm sorry, I should say who I assume is an evangelical, um, assume, made assumptions about my faith and my background and my experience and assumed that I knew nothing about evangelicalism or that I was not or had never been an evangelical. Um, and perhaps uh, was a bit frustrated with perhaps some of my characterizations of evangelicals. Um, but could not communicate it in a way where he clearly said, would say, I'm an evangelical and Eugene, I think that's unfair um, because that I believe would be him showing his own bias in ways that would compromise the journalism. And secondly, another example is I have had um, editors who are, it's kind of the same idea. I've had editors who are from white working class communities and rural communities, maybe in the South, who um, perhaps were a bit sensitive with how those communities were being depicted and maybe pushed back in ways that um, reflected their bias more than mine. Um, and, uh, you know, challenged me in ways in terms of how I was covering something that um, maybe made them uncomfortable um, 
and didn't lead to any significant conflict, but certainly like more drawn out um, conversations about a topic. Um, another question uh, that I'm just curious about, Do, are, there, are there particular uh, religious groups or denominations or churches that you have uh, more difficulty uh, covering than others? Me personally, or just you think the industry or me personally, I don't know as much about Catholicism as I would like to. Um, my, my, my faith background is the black church and you know large white evangelical churches. Um, and uh, I mean, I prop, yeah. And, and while I'm not as deeply knowledgeable of Judaism as I would like to, I probably have more anxiety writing about Catholicism than uh, Judaism. And I don't know if it's just because it's this huge institution that like um, <laughs> uh, carries weight and influence um, and power. And like, there's not a lot of wiggle room for messing up. Not that there is for other faiths, but um, and I haven't had to write about Catholicism as much uh, in the last four years. I mean, the major faith stories have been evangelicals in the Black church. Um, but, you know, as Biden, as in the White House, there's been more attention on more liberal views of Catholicism, uh, more liberal sex, maybe, should I say, of Catholicism. Um, and I'm just very careful. I speak to more experts. Um, I. Uh, double check things in ways that I perhaps um, don't usually. And um, I think that's a good thing. So uh, as somebody who's uh, very familiar with and uh, interacts within the, the, the black Protestant church, um, just as, a, as an individual uh, and a person of faith, what would you, uh, say that uh, white evangelicals needed to know about the Black Protestant Church? That's a great question. I think um, and, and give me some grace here, but I would this is what I would say to um, white evangelicals who are not as familiar with the Black Church and the politics of the Black Church and um, may not understand how members of this community, you know, responded to Trump or politics in general. I would say, think about um, how big of a sin you believe abortion is. Racism is that big of a sin to members of the black church. And anytime any policies or ideas are uh, rooted in racism or even have racist implications. Um, members of the black church view that um, as a sin against God, not just personally offensive, but like as something that is in direct conflict with uh, their faith. And so um, I don't think personally, um, most black Christians that I have interviewed or study are one issue voters and I and one can make the argument that the idea that the number of white evangelicals that are one issue voters is actually far smaller than people think but if there was anything close to one issue um, for many members of the black church that motivates how they vote um, it, it would be how lawmakers respond to the sin of racism I have another question. Um, you mentioned um, a couple of your other, um, not employees, uh, coworkers having to deal with um, hate mail. Have you gotten any like positive feedback from uh, articles that you've written and like how have you been able to interact with that? Yeah, you know, I, um, my mom is a that you know, very uh, faithful reader of the Washington Post. Um, I was on Morning Joe yesterday at MSNBC and they were making fun of me for how much my mom tweets me praise uh, at, while I'm actually on TV. Um, 
And uh, so I get her feedback quite a bit, but, but more seriously, um, whenever I write about a group that feels like they perhaps don't get as much attention, um, I tend to get a lot of positive feedback. And we don't get as many letters anymore in this social media climate, like good story. If people like or don't like something, it's usually a reply to a tweet, um, which is great to me. Um, so there's a lot of, I think that's a, you know, a lot easier than you know, the old days of having to write a letter and put it in the mail. Um, and so um, I, I, do, I do get a lot of positive feedback. I don't, I, don't, I don't come in contact with as much of my hate mail as one would think. One, I, I never read the comments on my articles, like literally never. Um, and uh, when people, uh, you know, say I, I have uh, words that are blocked on my social media that keep me from you know seeing certain tweets um, uh, because a lot of the criticism of journalists of color or women journalists or queer journalists or journalists from any marginalized community uh, very quickly um, turns to criticizing their identities beyond their uh, be and, and not just their work like if you ever look at, if you ever read the hate mail that like women get compared to like the average uh, hate mail that a man gets, they're usually called, you know, B word or sluts or things like that in ways that um, ultimately aren't helpful. And so for me, um, and getting something comparable as a black man, I, um, I don't read a lot of my hate mail, but um, the positive responses I, I see really often. How would you encourage young journalists um, who maybe don't have as much in contact with identity politics to be engaging um, with similar material that you're covering or um, engaging with different people of um, different identities? Yeah, no, that's a great question. I mean, how do we, you know, how do aspiring journalists or just citizens learn about groups of people that they don't know a lot about? You know, when I moved to Arizona, to be a reporter, I realized that I didn't have a lot of uh, knowledge about like the Hispanic experience in America. Um, and what social media I think has done, uh, which is great, is it has connected us with people that we would never be able to hear from uh, based on our real lives, our actual day-to-day -day lives. And so I would encourage people just to read, to read, read, and to listen and to uh, approach conversations with humility, especially as a young person, because as smart and informed and hopeful and talented as you are, there are a lot of things you still don't know and you're still learning. Um, and so um, I, I would say, you know, and I mean this as respectfully as possible, talk less and listen more. Um, and uh, while it's okay to have you know, deeply held convictions, hold space for the possibility that they may change um, and uh, don't have such a depth grip on your worldviews that when presented with new information, you feel like you can't reconsider some things that you maybe uh, assumed were true for the past 20 years. Um, and just also, you know, be patient with yourself and give yourself a lot of grace and room to um, grow and, and become uh, more informed about the issues in which uh, you will soon be expected to weigh in. That's the second time you've mentioned reading. So um, if I can just ask for your top recommendations of either authors or books that um, would be really influential for us to read. Yeah, you know, it really depends on the topic, right? And so, um, it, you know, if it comes to like race, you talked about like some what someone asked about specifically something about the black church. I think like Jamar Tisby is really great. Uh, he's a doctoral student at uh, University of Mississippi, but I think now is at BU at Boston University. Um, uh, in terms of, I mean, it's just, it really varies. It, it um, these are easier questions to ask, ask uh, on a specific topic. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, I my I think my DMs are open. Um, but if there if there's if there's someone that anyone ever is thinking I would like to learn more about this group, um, I could I could answer there. I mean, I know in the past two or three weeks, quite frankly, I have followed like quite a few um, Asian American activists and people affiliated with um, groups that speak to anti Asian racism. Um, who have been doing this work for years that I previously um, did, wasn't even aware of until unfortunately, you know, um, we saw this increase in anti-Asian, uh, you know, hate. And so, I mean, that's another example of like a community that I'm, I'm learning a lot about and listening to um, and realizing that these aren't isolated incidents, even that just started with, you know, the pandemic, but are rooted in American history um, and and prejudices that you know um, devalue lives of people who have uh, Asian ancestors. You've talked a lot about the importance of students listening and learning. Um, so, what do you think the most formative event or moment was for you um, in your journalism career as you were learning? from other people or other experiences? You know, I would say, um, I don't know that this was the most formative in terms of learning from people, but I will say the most formative experience I had in my journalism career was um, following my junior year, um, I realized that, uh, I did not want to be a journalist. Um, I was a broadcast journalism major and um, uh, I am very terrible at tech and production and I always have been um, and that's not gonna change. Um, but when you're a young broadcast journalist, you are doing your own lighting and shooting and editing and recording and um, for me, that made storytelling very unpleasant. And so I, you know, was having the privilege of enjoying a liberal arts education where I was studying all of these really interesting things, but I was having a very difficult time uh, producing stories for, uh, you know, my journalism classes. And um, I was already, you know, at the end of the majority of my college career and I was sad and I was depressed because I was going to, I was about to get this degree um, in this thing that I didn't want to do. And so um, I had my first quarter life crisis and I went to Africa that fall. I went to South Africa to study abroad at the University of Cape Town after applying to, you know, this program. And I was just like, I don't know what I want to do, but like, I might as well try to study abroad um, because um, so many of my fraternity brothers had done that and uh, they thought it was a great experience and, and I, I was interested. Um, the study abroad program had an internship component um, and the director of the program assigned us internships and he assigned me to a newspaper. And I was like, no, I don't wanna do this. I'm finished with the journalism. I don't know what I want to do, but I want to do something else. And he said, you should do this. And I did it. Um, and I loved it. And I realized that I didn't want to be a TV journalist. I wanted to write. And so the majority of my career actually has been in writing. And I did not um, do TV stuff. Even when I was hired at CNN, I was hired to write for CNNpolitics.com. They eventually put me on TV because interest in the 2016 election was so high um, that um, people were watching television so much that they needed to get more TV guests who were reporting. Um, and I love doing, um, you know, national news opposed to local news because I don't have to do all the editing and lighting and that kind of stuff um, at that level. Um, until there was a pandemic and I had to set all of this up myself. Um, but this is easy um, compared to what I had to do. And so I say that was a really formative moment for me because I literally almost left journalism um, had I not had a professor who was more aware of my skills and gifts and could direct me 
um, in the right direction um, and help you know me try to figure out what it was that I wanted to do. And so um, that was an amazing experience. And um, you know, being in Cape Town was just unmatched. There's another student question asking kind of about your, your journey through journalism. Um, and they're just wondering what types of jobs and experiences did you have that led to such um, prestigious and noteworthy job opportunities that's gotten you such national coverage? Yeah, you know, I, my, um, that's a great question. Um, I, like I said, my senior year, I was, work, I, um, was, was reporting at BET News for a youth journalism show they had. Um, and when I was in college, I interned at the NBC affiliate here in DC um, because I was in a high school scholarship program uh, with the Washington Post. And I also interned in Charlotte um, and I interned in Cape Town. And the reality is those internships largely came from two things. One, I, I was attending a school where there were connections with people in those offices. Um, and um, I was based in DC, which is um, you know, a, a pretty competitive internship market. Um, and so I, I did, and, and you know, job opportunities and experiences build upon the, the previously existing ones. Um, but I have I I know that there are lots of people that I work with that um, started um, off with like less competitive or prestigious internships and have found themselves um, you know in their dream jobs because they do really great work and if you are a hard worker and do excellent work. Um, uh, opportunities will provide themselves or present themselves um, regardless of how maybe not competitive um, you may view the place you're currently at or interested in. It may take longer, it may be harder to get where you wanna go, but um, the cream always rises to the top regardless of where it is. Do you think growing up in such a politically charged environment impacted um, you becoming an identity politics reporter? It did. It did. As you know, my um, my parents worked on Capitol Hill. I, I grew up running around the U.S. Capitol and and the Rayburn Building um, because that was you know where my parents worked. Um, but in terms of identity politics in particular, I grew up. I'm a city boy. I grew up in the city. Uh, but my mom is from a very small town in the South. And so I became aware, even before I had the language, that urban life and rural life are, are very different in some ways um, for very different reasons. And that fascinated me. Um, you know, I spent time, you know, in DC on, you know, downtown bustling areas and like on my grandfather's farm uh, also. And, and, um, it helped me just realize that the world was different uh, for different people and that was okay and that was good, but like it was still one world and we had to figure out ways to um, like be in it together. And that could be very difficult and challenging at times, um, but was an, you know, an endeavor worth pursuing. Would you say that you're in your dream job now or is there another area that is still kind of the dream out there. You know, the truth is I am in my dream job. Um, and I, this is a dream that I never even envisioned for myself. You know, I, um, you know, I would, I would encourage all of you all to dream big and to dream bigger than you're even dreaming um, because um, there are possibilities um, out there for you to do a lot of what you would like to do. I have a very supportive um, boss and a team that respects me. And, um, you know, I know, you know, you all are students, but some of you all have had, uh, you know, summer jobs and part-time jobs now. If you've ever had a boss, you know, um, that doesn't respect you or, you know, doesn't believe in your work, that can be a very, very difficult work environment to be in. Um, and I know what that's like. And so I'm grateful not to be in that any longer. Um, 
and uh, I have a company that's you know well funded and um, takes uh, risk and leaps to try to produce really good work, and uh, that has been uh, a very rewarding experience. I am um, looking back to looking forward to getting back in the newsroom. Um, partly, I thought I would hate working from home, but um, I have enjoyed it way more than I thought. I have on uh, a, a jacket and tie and basketball shorts right now, which is not what I would be able to do if I were in a newsroom and I don't have on shoes. And I, um, I, would, I would like things to maybe stay this way for a while. This is very comfortable. Um, so, yeah. Well, Eugene, uh, we can't thank you enough for being a part of this. This has just been delightful yeah. to listen to. And uh, I know these students and the others on this uh, Zoom call have, have deeply appreciated you just speaking from your heart. And uh, we want to thank you for this and uh, wish you blessings on this evening, OK? Thank you so much for having me. And I wish you all a great end of the semester and uh, an amazing uh, summer and, and rest of 2021. Okay, thanks so much. Take care. Bye.